John chapter 15. Continuing our study in the book of John here on the I Am Statements. And this is our sixth one. Our last one here, rather, seventh one. And uh, we'll be looking at verses 1 through 8. John chapter 15, verses 1 through 8. He says this, I am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you. As a branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can ye, except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. If a man abide not in me, he is, a cast, he is uh, cast forth as a branch, uh, and is withered. And men gather them, and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified, that ye bear much fruit, so shall ye be my disciples. Let's pray once more. Father, thank you so much to get to be with your people tonight. Lord, I thank you so much that we get to be around your word. And Lord, we don't uh, face any kind of persecution for doing so. Uh, Lord, we thank you for the freedom to be able to study your word in and, and a, and a building, in an air-conditioned building. Lord, we thank you so much for that. Lord, we thank you for the ones that have come out tonight. Uh, Lord, we pray that you please just speak to their hearts. Uh, use this, Lord, not just as head knowledge, although, uh, Lord, getting some of this information sure will help us, uh, especially when confronting false doctrine. But, Lord, I pray that we could... Uh, Understand the scripture, Lord, of abiding in you, Lord, that we, could, that we would abide in you and that we would be fruitful uh, while we are here on this earth. And, and, Lord, we love you. We thank you for all you do for us. Thank you for all the blessings, Lord, that you allow us to receive. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. As we, as we discussed uh, last week, Jesus had uh, just told his disciples, if you remember, that he was going away. We talked about that. We went over this uh, when addressing that sixth I am statement. And we concluded, as the scripture concluded, that Jesus is the way and his disciples knew the way. And they had known the way for quite a while, for three and a half years to be exact. And he said that he was the truth, not just one truth among many truths, but the truth. And lastly, he is in fact the life, the life source of all believers. But we stopped in verse number 6 of chapter 14. And the rest of the chapter, you have Jesus Christ giving specific description of his relationship to God, uh, the Father, and his commission to this lost and dying world as a mouthpiece of God and as the sacrifice for fallen man. And then in verse number 8 through 14, uh, verse 8 through 14, come out of, the, of a question or maybe a request from Philip. Look at there. Uh, it says, Philip saith unto him, chapter number 14, verse number 8, Philip, Philip saith unto him, Lord, show us the Father, uh, and it sufficeth us. And uh, verse number 10 down there, it says, Believest thou not that I am the Father, and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father in me, or else believe me for the very work's sake. Uh, so he clarifies that for Philip there. Then in verse number 15 through 31 of chapter 14, Jesus returns to his conversation about his departure and that he is going to leave them, that he is not going to leave them comfortless, but the Lord will send another comforter, um, the Holy Spirit of God, to dwell in the hearts of believing men. And isn't that such a blessing to know, uh, praise the Lord for sending his Son, and praise the Lord for sending his Spirit to dwell in man. I mean... Uh, uh, verse number 26, it says, But the Comforter, uh, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. So the Holy Spirit, as I often say and will continue to say, is the most underappreciated part of the Godhead. Probably the one that gets left out the most. Uh, and the one that doesn't get, uh, I know doesn't get the appreciation uh, that it needs um, here. But uh, the Holy Spirit... Uh, is fulfills a huge role in our lives. Without the Holy Spirit, we wouldn't have a lot of things in our life. Um, according to this verse, uh, he teaches the believer. There isn't anything that you learn in Scripture apart from the Spirit of God. He teaches you those things. 
It's not you yourself that, that believes all these things. The Holy Spirit shows you these things. The Holy Spirit leads you and guides you into all truth. Uh, and He teaches the believer. He brings things to our remembrance. Have you ever been in a conversation and you maybe have forgotten a verse and here it comes, it pops up in your head and you're able to quote the whole thing? That wasn't you, that was the Holy Spirit. He brings those things to your remembrance. He's the one when you're out in the wilderness and you're not doing right. He's the one that, that, that helps remember what you had at the Father's house. He's the one that teaches you those things. He's the one that brings those things to our remembrance. He's the one that convicts us of our sin. He's the one that does all that. John chapter 16, verse 8 through 9. He is the one who regenerates a new believer. Praise the Lord. It's not we ourselves. It's the Holy Spirit that regenerates a new believer. He seals our salvation. We are sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Uh, he witnesses to us of our salvation. Ain't that right? Isn't that good? There have been times where I feel like I haven't been saved, and now I'll, I'll realize that here is the Holy Spirit. He's convicting me of my sin. If I'm a lost man, He doesn't convict me of my sin. So that's how I know I'm saved. He witnesses to us of our salvation. Listen, He prays for us. Praise the Lord, He prays for us. Because there sure have been times where I haven't been fit for prayer, and the Holy Spirit prays for me with, with groanings which cannot be uttered. He prays for us. And obviously from this passage, he comforts us. You ever been in a time in your life where you've been downtrodden and had a broken heart or, or can't find where uh, you need to go, what church you need to go to, and you, the Holy Spirit comforts you and says, you'll find one. We will, I'll, I'll lead you to the right one. Maybe you have a death in the family. And it's the Holy Spirit that comforts your heart, gives you peace which passes uh, understanding. That's the Holy Spirit that does that. He prays for us. He comforts us. He empowers us to serve God. Right? Our flesh doesn't want to go to the nursing home. Our flesh doesn't want to go on the street corner. Our flesh doesn't want to hear preaching for that matter. Right? But it's the Holy Spirit that empowers us to serve God. He gives us discernment. Praise the Lord. He gives us discernment. He has kept me out of a lot of messes because he has, put that, he has given me discernment in situations. You know, those times where you felt like maybe you could have put your foot in your mouth, but you didn't because the Holy Spirit gave you discernment and wisdom? Yeah, that was the Holy Spirit. He produces fruit in our life. Galatians chapter 5, verse 22, 22 through 23, and, uh, which we'll, we'll cover here tonight. But, uh, so, so praise the Lord for His Spirit tonight. All those things the Holy Spirit is for the believer. And every time I go into prayer, I try to talk to the Holy Spirit. I say, Holy Spirit, I thank you for, and I'll go down this list, and I'll say, I thank you for empowering me. I thank you for uh, giving me the discernment and giving me wisdom and, and, and convicting me of my sin. And I'll go through the whole list and thank you. And I believe you ought to, too. It's good, good practice. Praise the Lord for the Holy Spirit. But uh, that was a little side note. But, uh, but then we come to our last I am statement made in the book of John. And in verse number 15, uh, chapter number 15, verse number 1, I am the vine. Now, I believe that the disciples have just departed from the upper room. I think it's pretty evident from Scripture. And, and uh, this discourse probably takes place uh, en route to the Garden of Gethsemane. And as Christ has done on many other occasions, he takes an illustration from nature to describe uh, the union between himself uh, and his disciples. But I want to make clear tonight what this passage is not speaking of. It's not promoting the idea of losing your salvation. That's what it is not doing. It is not promoting the idea that you can somehow be outside of Christ. Or that, that what these verses are talking about, that you can lose your salvation. And teachers and preaching, preachers, even in our independent Baptist churches today, use this passage along with Romans chapter 11 to prove that one can lose their salvation. And I'm here to tell you tonight that that is heresy. That's false doctrine. And it's being preached in our churches. That is completely false, and to be quite honest with you, it's a mishandling of God's Word. It's not studying to show yourself to prove unto God, but studying to show yourself to prove unto the YouTube video that you watched on this passage of Scripture. Some like to teach that this passage is talking about true Christians and fake Christians. And I would say that that is another mishandling of God's Word. And listen, as we will look at tonight, you, you, you can't be a branch in the vine without, be, without being a believer in Christ. 
You must understand that. To hold this view would be to assume that every person was in Christ, and if you don't do the right things or uh, you don't uh, uh, do the right works, then you are cut away and burned, as the scripture, as we read there. This passage isn't talking about those things, but rather, as evident from the text, it is talking about fellowship and fruitfulness of a believer. That's what it's talking about. That's what this passage is talking about. It's not talking about losing your salvation. It's talking about fellowship and fruitfulness. So let's jump right in here. Number one, if you've got a pen and paper, the true vine. And th- listen, uh, this is a common verse. I have been taken to this verse over and over and over again by uh, charismatics and uh, other denominations using this verse and pulling this scripture out of context to prove their their uh, doctrine of losing one's salvation. But uh, the true vine, there's a lot more here than that, but I, I kind of want to poke holes in that tonight. Uh, and uh, I believe we understand from the text who the vine is and who the husband is, but for the sake of the, of the passage, I'm going to discuss all that. So verse number one, he says, I am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. The true vine is none other than, do you know who? The Lord Jesus Christ. And as... Many times in the gospel, it connects the Lord to Jehovah of the Old Testament. And Jesus Christ is, Jesus Christ is the true vine, putting him in, uh, in contrast to other vines. And, and this other vine is none other than the nation of Israel. And repeatedly in the Old Testament, the nation of Israel is described in a figurative sense as a vine. Uh, turn, if you would, to Psalm chapter 80. Psalm chapter 80. We're going to be doing a little bit of uh, turning tonight. So Psalms chapter 80. I want to read verses 8 through 9. Psalm chapter 80, verses 8 through 9. He says this. Thou hast brought a vine out of where? Egypt. Now, is that the church? No. Who's that talking about? It's talking about Israel. Thou hast cast out the heathen and planted it. Thou uh, preparedest room before it and didst cause it to take deep root and it filled the land. This verse describes the nation of Israel's planting and growth. Their establishment as a nation, if you would. Psalm chapter 80, verse 1, 8 through 9 there. Uh, but, then, uh, this, but then you have Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 21. It says, Yet I had planted thee a noble vine, Holy, a right seed, how then art thou turned unto the uh, degenerate plant of a strange vine unto me? And this describes the nation of Israel's failure. Compared to a strange and empty vine, they were not uh, and, and did not fulfill what they were supposed to do. And that's what that verse is talking about. Uh, but then you get into verses like Isaiah chapter 5 and verse 5, and it says something like this. It says, and now go to, I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will take away the hedge thereof, and it shall be eaten up, and break down the wall thereof, and it shall be trodden down. Turn if you would to Ezekiel chapter 15. Ezekiel chapter 15. I'm talking about this other vine, compared to, uh, comparing contrast the Lord Jesus Christ to this other vine. He says, I am the true vine. If he's saying, I'm the true vine, then he is putting himself in contrast to another vine, which is the nation of Israel. Uh, Ezekiel chapter 15, verses 1 through 6, it says, And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, what is the vine tree more than any tree, or than a branch which is among the trees of the forest? Shall we be taken thereof to do any work? Or will men take a pen of it, a pint of it, uh, to hang any vessel thereon? Behold, it is a cast into the fire for fuel. The fire devoureth both the ends of it, and the midst of it is burned. It is meat for any work. Behold, when it, was, when it was whole, it was meat for no work. How much less shall it be meat uh, yet for any work when the fire hath devoured it, and it is burned? Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, as a vine tree among the trees of the forest, which I have given the fire for fuel, so will I give the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Now, this is a prophecy of the nation's destruction. That's what this verse is talking about. Christ is a true vine that did not fail to function as the fruit-bearing pleasure that His heavenly Father intended Him to be. The Lord Jesus Christ fulfilled all those things. And it's interesting to note that there are many similarities between the nation of Israel and the Lord Jesus Christ who is revealed as the Son of God in the New Testament. But the fact is that they are so closely related uh, in the prophetic scriptures that one needs to be very careful when distinguishing 
between the two, between the Lord Jesus Christ and the nation of Israel. But the majority of the references would be in Isaiah, and for the sake of time, we're not going to go over those, but even some prophetic scriptures can have double application here. They can have double application to the nation of Israel and the Lord Jesus Christ, such as verses uh, like Hosea chapter 11, verse 1. And that's a, good, uh, that's a good example there. But Jesus Christ, I want us to understand tonight that Jesus Christ, the true vine, did what the other vine could not do, and that was bear much fruit. And it's important to distinguish that the true vine is Jesus Christ and not Israel, or else you have some weird false doctrine that you have today, like replacement theology. That's what you have today. Uh, and one shouldn't have to guess, you know, one shouldn't have to guess that statement because Jesus plainly tells his disciples that he is, in verse 1, the true vine. And Christ is the true vine, providing a relationship that produces wine of joy and gladness, as talked about in Psalm chapter 104, verse 15. Uh, Christ is the true vine, producing the pure vine, a type of blood that heals and gives life. Turn, if you would, uh, to 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1. And that's, you also have Luke chapter 10, verse 34, but you also have 1 Peter 1, 18 through 19. If, if I have the wrong reference here, forgive me, but I think this is right. 1 Peter 1, 18 through 19. It says this, For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things, as silver and gold, from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with precious, but with the precious, what? Blood of Christ, as a lamb without blemish and without spot. Tonight, listen, he is the true vine, okay? He's a true vine. And naturally, I would think, uh, you know, I would think we would understand that the father is the husband because uh, he specifies such in verse number one. Uh, he says, my father is the husband. I don't, it don't get much simpler than that, right? Uh, so we're not going to, um, not just there, not just 15.1, uh, but it also tells you Isaiah chapter 60, verse 21, Isaiah chapter 61 and verse number 3, 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 3, verse 9. It is God that plants the vine, okay, purges and prunes the vine and partakes of the fruit of the vine. And I'm not uh, going to spend a lot of time on that. So number two, number one, I am the vine. Number two, the branches, the branches. Look at verse number two through six. It says this, that every branch... In me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away, and every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can ye, except ye abide in me. I am the vine, and ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. If a man abide not in me... He is cast forth as a branch and is withered, and men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. Okay? Um, let's first look tonight at the, character, the characteristics of a branch. Okay? Some of this may bore you. I don't really know. I think it's fascinating myself. Uh, but number one, branches don't produce fruit. Do you get that? Branches don't produce fruit. Now, have you ever seen a branch on its own produce fruit? Anybody ever seen that? I have it. Uh, if, I, if I could, you know, if it could, uh, you would see branches laying on the ground bearing fruit on their own. But that's not what happens. You don't see that. Uh, it's the vine that produces the fruit, and the branches are nothing more than humble instruments to bear the fruit that the vine produces. Verse number 4 tells us that. And that's all that a branch does is to bear that fruit. That's the only purpose of the branch is to bear that fruit that that vine produces. Number two, branches don't eat fruit. They don't eat the fruit, and neither do the vines uh, for that matter. The fruit that is produced is not for the vine or the branches, but rather for the husbandman. Have you ever seen a branch eat the fruit that it's bearing? I have never seen that. Branches don't maintain themselves. They can't be responsible for maintenance uh, uh, of the branch. They are, they are utterly dependent uh, on the husbandman for their service. It is God that washes away disease or prunes away the deadness, not the branch. We can do the right things, but it is the Lord who works in us. 
We must understand these things. These are fascinating truths. I believe it's a perfect example of our relationship to Christ and our relationship to God. Uh, Branches from a vine are altogether useless outside of bearing fruit. Did you know that? Well, they do serve a purpose, maybe. Switching your kids, maybe. But uh, branches from a vine, I better be careful saying that. Um, branches from a vine are altogether useless outside of bearing fruit. And this is, the, this is the sole purpose of a believer is to bear fruit. For the pleasure and for the satisfaction and for the glory of the husbandman. That is our only responsibility as branches. And if a branch doesn't bear fruit, he is entirely useless to the husbandman. Useless. And uh, so we should bear much fruit. Fruit such as, okay, souls. Proverbs chapter 11, verse 30 says, The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and he that winneth souls is what? Wise, right? Holiness. We're to bear holiness. Romans chapter 6, verse 22 says, But now being made free from sin and become service to God, ye have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. We should bear uh, righteousness. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 11 says this, Now no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. A believer should bear the fruit of the Spirit, which we, uh, most of us know. Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 through 23 says this, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. And I've often, I've often wondered why love is first. I, I, I was down there in Alabama, and I asked my, I was teaching uh, the little kids at that time, and I asked, one of the little, I asked the little kids, I said, why do you think that the Lord put love first? Why do you think that the Lord put love first? And the pastor's son raised his hand, and I said, oh, and go ahead. And he said, I believe that, that love is first because uh, if you don't have, if you get love right, all the rest of them will fall into place. I said, that is correct. I believe that's right. If you get love right, you'll have no problem with uh, all those other fruit of the Spirit there. I believe that, is, uh, that coincides with uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, the charity chapter, verses 1 through 8 there. I believe you can get that from that. Without charity, you can do nothing, Right? Without love there, none of this other fruit can be possible. Uh, so there's a reason why love is there. But love, joy, peace, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, against such there is no law. And honestly, these are just a few. And I'm sure we could find other fruit like discipling a new convert. Wouldn't you, wouldn't you say that's bearing fruit? Sure. Sure. Maybe comforting a hurting heart. Maybe helping keep a marriage together. Maybe encourage someone to stay in church and in the ministry. Those are all things that could be uh, fruit-bearing uh, ministries. But if we are not bearing fruit, listen, I want us to understand tonight, if you and I are not bearing fruit, we are useless to the husbandman. As a matter of fact, there are two kinds of branches according to verse number two. Two kinds of branches. This is really simple tonight. Those that bear fruit and those that bear no fruit. Okay? Uh, verse number two said, Every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it that it may bring forth more fruit. Or as he puts it in verse number 5, he says, much fruit. Much fruit. The husbandman purges those that bear that fruit. And this purging is twofold tonight. Uh, Purge here, number one thing, first thing, purge here will mean to wash as we can see from verse number 3. Uh, some people get confused about that verse number three there because it doesn't seem like it's in place. But if you know anything about uh, cleaning or pruning these uh, or cleaning these these vines, you'll understand that a little better. But he says, "Now ye are clean. Now ye are clean." Present tense through the word, um, and the word in Ephesians chapter five verse twenty six is referred to as water. It says that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of the water by the word. That's by that word there. And a branch needs to be cleansed of bugs. It needs to be cleansed of disease. And at times, uh, we too need to be washed by the water of the word. And that's exactly why it's a good thing for a believer to get in the book, to study the Bible, is so that he can be clean. You know, we always talk about you know, the, the, the filth of this world. You know what will keep that filth away out of your life and, out, and, and from, uh, from making you filthy, the things of this world I'm talking about? Stay in that word. Be in that book. The Bible says it'll cleanse you. It'll wash you. Just as it does that branch. 
Number two, purging the branches will also mean pruning those dead parts to allow uh, maybe more room for growth. Just like in the, just like in the garden, it, it always seems as though uh, when you prune those flowers or trees, they always, they always, always, always come back fuller with more brooms and with more fruit. Ain't that right? Uh, we had some, we had some uh, rose bushes that we planted down there when we, when we fixed the front of the church uh, down there in Alabama. And, uh, you know, a couple months went by, several months went by, and I realized that this thing was just getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And it was, before too long, it was just taking over this thing. I pruned those things back. And guess what? It came back fuller <laughs> with more buds, with more blooms. And, uh, you know, it's just, that's, that's, the pur- that's the purpose of pruning and purging. But that thought is not always pleasant for a believer, as shown consistently through the New Testament. And oftentimes, uh, a sometimes painful and trying road leads to fruitfulness and maturity of a believer. They come back bearing more fruit and stronger than they were before. And as verse says, and as the verse says there, it says bearing much fruit and honestly glorifying God. You know, some of us look at this pruning. Sometimes the things that happen in our life, we look at it as though it's a bad thing. And sometimes it might just be God pruning and purging us for something greater, to bear more fruit, to, be, to bear much fruit. But then there are those that bear no fruit. And this is kind of where I want to stick the rest of the night here. Those that bear no fruit. Verse number two. Every branch that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. Now, the false teacher takes this verse, okay? He takes this verse and verse 6 along with Romans chapter 11 and teaches that you can lose your salvation, be burned and thrown in the fire. They teach that. This taking away isn't talking about one's position in Christ, but rather one's fruitfulness in Christ. And it is the difference, this is the difference between standing and state. We must understand tonight this principle of standing and state. A believer's standing in Christ is fixed before God. It's fixed before God and established once and final and forever uh, before God at salvation. And we must understand plainly from the New Testament that a church-age saint cannot be ripped from the body of Christ. Amen. Do you believe that tonight? Do you believe that a, a New Testament saint who is saved and blood-bought by the Lord Jesus Christ can be ripped Amen. out of the Lord Jesus Christ? John chapter 6, verse 37 says this, All that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. I don't know... If it can get any plainer than that. But it does. John chapter 10, verse 27 through 29. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give unto them eternal life. And they shall, what? Never perish. Neither shall any man, any man, pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all. And no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. No man. That includes oneself. Because he is a man. Cannot cause you to lose your salvation. I have this guy, a fool. He, is a, he was a, a complete fool. He said that, uh, you know, it talks about we are in the Father's hand. You know, we're in, the, we're in uh, Jesus' hand. Jesus is in the Father's hand. Nothing can, nothing can pluck us out of the hand of God, right? He says, unless you open the pinky of God and jump out. I said, my, my goodness, that's stretching just a little bit, don't you think? Nothing. Nothing, okay? No man means no man, and no man includes you, Amen. right? James 2.10, Galatians 3.10, 2 Timothy 1.12. It is Jesus who keeps us saved, saved and not we ourselves. It's not us. Galatians 2.21, Romans 8, 38 through 39. Nothing, including ourselves, can separate us from the love of God, which is found where? In Christ Jesus. In the vine. John 1, 12 through 13. 1 John 5, 11 through 13. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13. Ephesians 4, 30. 1 John 5, 13. 1 John 3, 20. 1 John 4, 18. Titus 1, 2. 1 John 2, 25. Need I say any more scriptures? Right? You can tell. It irritates me. You have people going around teaching people they can lose their salvation. Like the grace of God isn't sufficient. Like Jesus Christ can't do his job. The Holy Spirit, his seal is not good enough. 
It's Jesus. It's not, it's not us. It's not us. We, we, cannot, we cannot, like as I said last week, there's nothing that we can do to mess this thing up. Jesus Christ has did this thing. He's the one that seals us. He's the one that keeps us. Now I'm not telling you you can go live however you want to live. We should not use God's grace on occasion to sin. God forbid. But it's evident to me from Scripture that we cannot be taken away or put out of the vine. But you can, okay, however, you can become a castaway. As Paul says, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 27. Uh, one can fall asleep in the Lord's service. Romans chapter 13, verse 11. Ephesians chapter uh, 5, and verse number 14. And here, listen here. You can be destroyed. In a nice fire. You can be destroyed. 1 Corinthians 3, 17 says, If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. You. Okay? For the sake of time, I'm not going to turn to Romans 8, 13. But that just gives you more clarification there, okay? But this taken away here could certainly have application to any of these conditions. Any one of those three conditions I just gave. This does not mean that you lose your salvation. Okay? This would not change a believer's standing with God, but rather it would change his state. Because a believer's state... His standing is determined and fixed, but his state is determined by his continued obedience and submission to the will of God. That affects that fellowship there. There will come a day, listen church, there will come a day when verse 6 will take place, and it is not talking about former believers who don't believe enough being cast into a lake of fire, but rather a different fire. Turn, if you would, to 1 Corinthians 3. 1 Corinthians 3. We must understand this tonight, church. I believe that there are too many saints that don't understand this. And when somebody brings this before us, we lose our minds because, well, I've never, I don't, I, don't, I don't know what that's talking about. Because it used the word fire. Okay? And we automatically think lake of fire. But uh, 1 Corinthians chapter number 3. And look at here, verse number 12 through 15. Now, if this is not plain as day, I don't know what is. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 12 through 15 says this, Now if any man build upon his foundation gold, silver, precious stone, wood, hay, and stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by what? Fire. And the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. What? Not the soul, but the work. Of what sort it is. If any man's work abide, does that sound familiar? which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss. But he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. Does that make sense? Okay? That will, I believe, that verse will take place, the judgment seat of Christ. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 10 through 11. I believe it describes uh, the judge there. It talks about his eyes are at flames of fire. And I believe that it's at that moment that Jesus Christ will look into the hearts of men, will look into the souls of men, and will burn those works that are dead, that are wood, and they'll burn as wood, hay, and stubble, and he'll look with those fire, and, he'll, and he will purge, and he will uh, purify those works that are tried. There'll be gold and silver and precious stone, right? That's what that's going to happen. It ain't talking about losing your salvation. It ain't talking about being grafted out, taken out of Christ and thrown into a lake of fire. That's not what it's talking about. To take that is to twist the scripture of God. Read the scripture in its context. But don't miss the whole purpose of this message tonight. The, the Lord is, the, that the Lord has given his disciples here. And the message he's given, it's, it's about fellowship. It's about fellowship. Abiding in Christ, and as a result of abiding in Christ, there is fruitfulness. Verse number four and five. Number three, abiding in Christ. How are we to bear much fruit tonight? How are we going to bear much fruit? By abiding in Christ. And how do we abide in Christ, church? Well, I believe that the rest of the passage clarifies that for us. Look at verse, uh, number, verse number seven there. It says, through his word. Right? That is how he talks to you. 
is through His Word. Now, if you're not reading your Bible tonight, if you're not reading the Word of God, God is not talking to you. The Lord is not able to talk to you. Uh, other than the few minutes you get at church on Sunday and Wednesday night. But through His Word, verse number 7, He shall ask what you will. Guess what that is? That's prayer. That's how you talk to Him. Right? It's about a relationship. It's about a relationship. Number two, verse number nine, continue in his love. What's another way of abiding in Christ? Continue in his love. Abide in my love, verse number 10. Third thing, verse number 12, love one another. Verse number 13, sacrifice your time, talents, and treasures uh, on others. Verse number 17, love one another, right? Fourth thing, verse number 20, be a servant. Be a servant. This is a guaranteed recipe for fruitfulness and uh, It's abiding in Him. And He will produce fruit in your life for the pleasure and glory of the husbandman. That is all your life is. We are fruit bearers for God. That's what we are. Verse number 5, I am the vine and ye are the branches. He that abideth in me and I am him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. 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 So when somebody comes along and tries to use those verses, maybe you can help them out a little bit. Say, that's not what that verse is talking about. And by the way, people like to use Romans chapter 11. Romans chapter 11 is not talking about being being cut off and thrown into the fire, into the lake of fire. Romans chapter 11 is talking about nations. It's it's, It's talking about Israel. And it's talking about Gentile nations being grafted in. That's what it's talking about. It's not talking about losing your salvation. So I am the vine, and ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, ye can do nothing.